I'm Jack Militello, Professor of Management at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, today we're going to be talking about leadership. And leadership is one of those broad topics. Uh, on Amazon, there's probably uh, 20,000 different t uh, books on leadership. And of those, there's probably uh, you know, 500 different theories of leadership. Uh, so it means a lot, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, today I want to talk about leadership as influencing. In fact, I'm going to uh, look at a, a definition that, uh, that came out of a, a leadership textbook. It's that leadership is the process of influencing others to understand and agree about what needs to be done and how it can be done effectively. <clears throat> That's a pretty good definition. It's influencing others to be effective. It's not saying what's right or wrong. But the second part of the definition also holds a lot, a lot of power. It's the process of facilitating individual and collective efforts to accomplish the shared goal. So when we look at, at leadership, as we're going to talk about it, it's about influencing and facilitating. As you know, the root of the word facilitate is facile, make easy. Very rarely do we find uh, leaders who, who not only influence, but also make it easy to get the job done. And I think that's part of leadership. And I think it's rooted in communication. And uh, so, so let's talk about who the influential leader is. Uh, it's someone who leads with emotion and with power. <clears throat> you know, we, we look at, at truth and justice as something that uh, can't be overcome. We all know when we're being fooled. You know, we, we all know when people are being false in their presentations. Uh, so, so the idea is, is to be sincere. And, and leaders to influence people have to be honest. That's number one. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the parable of the emperor's new clothes, you say, okay, who blew the whistle on the, on the uh, emperor? It was the child, you know, the, the, the symbol of innocence. Uh, so, so it's a symbol that we all know when we're being fooled. So when leaders try to influence somebody and, and they do it with emotion, uh, it, it can't be false emotion. <clears throat> the second thing, uh, emotion comes before reason. A lot of times when we influence people, we try to do that through reason. Here are the facts. Here are the figures. Let me, let me tell you how to do it, or, or let me tell you how it adds up. A, a lot of business leaders do that because they feel that uh, you know, the numbers you know, kind of sell the day. But really, it's emotion. It's the connection with one another that, that sells first. You have to tell a story about yourself. Let people trust you, and then the reason will come second. Uh, I mean, the, the, the story I usually tell about reasoning is dealing with my dog. A you know, wonderful little dog, uh, and occasionally, I'll, uh, occasionally I'll try to reason with her, and I'll and I'll say, do you know, Gracie, that you should you shouldn't bark so much, or you should, uh, you know, be a little quieter in the backyard. And she looks at me, and I know what she's thinking. Is there food in it for me, uh, or do I have to move? So the reason doesn't affect her at all. <clears throat> it's the emotion, it's the feeling uh, that affects her. I'm not saying we treat people like dogs, but I'm just saying that that's a, an analogy for trying to understand that facts don't always tell the story. It's the emotional connection that works first, and the facts, by and large, are ignored. I mean, you can ask yourself how often you hear facts, and uh, you don't care because the facts don't make sense to you. They don't reach with emotion. <clears throat> what I'm going to show, what I'm going to re make a reference to right now, are two video clips about influencing. And they tell the, the same story, but much differently. Uh, one is from the movie 12 O'Clock High, featuring Gregory Peck. The other is from uh, Shakespeare's Henry V, featuring Kenneth Branagh. Both are asking young men to go to war <laughs> and, and to risk their lives. And they influence in different ways. The Gregory Peck character is very matter of fact, but it's still emotion. He's, he's hard, he's, he's pushing. But it's, he's attracting to a certain type of emotion. He wants, he wants the, the, the pilots to be tough, to be a little harder, to be more disciplined. Henry V uh, is talking about brotherhood, you know, what we share together, uh, how, how people will be uh, holding their manhoods cheap for not being with us uh, in this war. Uh, you know, so so it's, they're different approaches, but both influential. And I'm offering these to you just as a, as a way to show you that that influence happens in a variety of ways, and you could, you could attract different types of emotions or go out and deal with different types of emotions. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, way of going about uh, you know, dealing with people's emotions. So it can be hard, it can be soft. 
So take a look at these clips and see what you think. There's a concept that I want to talk about in terms of, uh, in terms of influence. And it's this concept that I call our leadership working space. Both uh, uh, Gregory Peck and Kenneth Branagh were in a working space. People were there. There were tensions in those spaces. And, there, and you see in this, this uh, graphic, there are vectors. And I, I describe one vector as your way and one vector as my way. Uh, many of us have been caught up in the my way, your way, way debate. And, and usually they're dead end. Usually we stay right on those vectors. We don't get off them into this working space. And that's what leadership and emotion does. It, it moves you off your vector, moves you off your position into the working space. You know, and if we got into a my way, your way discussion, which many of us have done, <clears throat> I would say I, it, there's three things I want to accomplish. I want to win. I want you to believe I'm right. And I don't want you angry with me. So that's one point of this vector. Imagine the other point, having the same things, wanting to win, wanting to think I'm right, and not wanting you to, you to be angry. We get ourselves in these dichotomous positions, and they are no win for anybody. So I'd like you to think about influence as moving into this leadership working space. Now, if you take a look at these vectors, and let me give you a, an absolute uh, on the y-axis of 10 and on the x-axis of 10. So, so what we do is, is we, we, we look at, uh, 10, 0, 10, 10, 0 is our way, the way we want to do things. What we really want to get at is 10, 10, the best of your way, the best of my way. That's an ideal. We're never going to get there. But that's what you try to do in the uh, leadership working space. You try to get to these 10, 10 positions. Now, in this graphic, you'll see 5, 5. What's a 5, 5? Ah, a compromise. So often we find ourselves in, in a compromise position. Uh, compromises get us something. They get us out of the room alive. You know, we could you know, end the discussion and say, okay, you got this, you got that, I got that. But in the, rea in the reality of it all, uh, compromise says everyone loses. So you can't stop at compromise. What you have to do is look at a good, uh, as a, a, a give and take, and rather than finding a compromise at 5-5, five, five, you might want to look at this as a spiral. You might want to say, okay, it's a long fishing trip. You get your way here, I get my way there. But we know what we're working towards. And I, and I think the idea of influential leadership is it provides a goal. So as, so as leaders, you have to provide a goal, even though it's, it's not defined. You know, it's, it's sort of the best outcome. And the best outcome is what we find through this working space. And it's not all about agreement either. It's nice to agree. But we still have to keep that outcome in mind. We still have to say we want an end that's going to be beneficial to everybody. And sometimes I have to give up what I want. You have to give, give up what you want. But you know, leaving the room agree, agreeing with each other and being friends is good, but it's not everything. We want to get to those 10-10 solutions. So, so as we talk about leadership, we're going to talk about influencing people in this leadership space or even to get them off the axes into that space. And, and how do we go about doing that? You know, if we, if we look at leadership as a function of consent, you know, people you know, are influenced by us. They let us lead them. We, we can't force the leadership. So uh, I'm going to talk about four things that, that really have to do with consent. And I picked these up from a, a book called The Function of the Executive by Chester Barnard. Uh, you know, one of the things Barnard says for people to, to accept you as a leader and accept your influence is that the communication has to be understood. Simple, right? Not very. I mean, we've all played that exercise where we sit in a room and someone hands a piece of paper to someone at one side of the room and it may say something like, uh, you know, Cleveland is on Lake Erie. And, and, the, uh, and the people whisper to each other and the message gets passed along. And when it comes out at the other end, you might say that, you know, the sky is blue. What happens in between with those communications? Well, first of all, it's unclear. You know, I, I didn't quite hear you. I didn't understand what you had to say. I could do it better. Let me take a twist at that. We do that all the time. That's human nature. You know, we, we communicate the way we communicate. You have to make sure communication is understood. 
And whose responsibility is that? Well, it, you could say it's the communicator's responsibility. I have to make sure as a leader, as someone who is influencing someone, that my communication is clear. So often when our communication is clear or misunderstood, we blame the recipient of that communication. And sure, people don't listen. But you have to work at it. You have to make sure that you're being heard. And, and you have to make sure that the communication is understood. And that's why we have feedback loops. So you ask people, do you understand that? What's your interpretation? Are we on the same page? Are we in the, or are we in the ballpark? Whatever it is. Remember, you're, you're talking about a leadership working space. This is part of the work of leadership, is influencing people. Get them to understand what you're talking about, and you understand what they're talking about, what their values are. It's not the my way, your way discussion. It's moving into this leadership working space. The second item is the communication is consistent with the mission of the organization. Back to the idea of false rhetoric in the emperor's new clothes. We all know what our corporations are about, or our businesses are about. And it's not necessarily the, the uh, stated mission statement that you put together at a planning meeting or some uh, you know, uh, you know, PR firm has given you. We understand what our real mission is. We know what's right. And I think people intuitively know what's right. So, so when, when you're influencing people, it has to be about what's right. It has to feature what's important to the mission of the organization. And it might not be absolutely clear, but at least it has to be in the direction that the mission of the organization is going. Otherwise, people won't care. They, they, they'll you know, look, at, look at this as a bit of a joke. The third issue is it has to be compatible with the individual self-interest. Yes, uh, it does matter what our self-interest it is. Uh, I mean, we, we do things because we think we're doing the right thing, but we do things that benefit us. Oftentimes, self-interests are short-term, and maybe the manager or leader that's trying to influence change has to look at, at uh, interests as long-term. But that's part of the communication. That's part of the story uh, a leader gives. You know, how, how do you make this all work? You, you make it work from the, this notion that we're, we're fulfilling the mission of the organization and it's helping you. Now, if you, if you drew the vector around uh, mission and individual interest, you might find some interesting discussions because uh, you know, people are not always compatible with their interests, with the, the interests of the organization. And sometimes there's got to be some working space activities to get people more in line with the mission of the organization. So just understand that that's part of the, uh, the transaction for consent. The fourth item, the person is, is able to mentally and physically comply with the communication. Now, we're not talking about people being you know, diminished or, or handicapped or anything. So often, uh, you know, we, we want to do things because we want to do them. Uh, we might not have the skills. If you're given a, a job to do something, you know, a statistical analysis, and you're not a good statistician, you're, you're going to screw it up. So, so what the leader has to do is make sure you have the skills. That's part of the facilitation. Can you do this? And it, it's all right to say, no, I can't do it. And, and if, if I can't do it, and, and I don't tell you that, I'm not going to give you a full consent. I'm going to fake it. You're not going to get a good outcome. So, so it's up to the leader who is influencing people to also facilitate that skills base that you need to get the job done. Remember, back to our, our leadership working space. We want to reach that 10-10. We want to find the best of your way, the best of my way. So we have to work together to get there, and we can't fake it. And you can't fake it about emotion. You can't fake it about uh, the mission. You can't fake it about skills either. So going back to this, this notion of consent, how do you really lead and influence? You do it by making the, communi the communication understood, by having the activities commensurate with the mission, also have them commensurate with the individual self-interest, and while you're doing that, you reconcile the individual self-interest with the organization's mission, and you make it so it can be done. You make it so that, it, that it's operationally feasible and viable. And, and that's what the leader has to do in order to move an organization forward towards reaching a goal. It's a wide variety of, of types of leaders. And I'm just going to touch on these. Uh, you know, there's, there's books galore on them. But uh, just, just, to, just to let you know that you, you can play different roles as a leader. Uh, you know, we, we have the notion of the visionary leader, and of course, Stephen Jobs 
is, is the, the, the ideal of the visionary leader, someone that has a great idea and fosters that great idea. Uh, someone that, that actually comes out of genius, but genius also comes out of talking to customers, you know, playing with the, uh, the, the materials of the organization, understanding how the back room works. So vision emerges from all that. And, and that's what I call the emergent leader, uh, someone who's open to opportunities. You know, we'll find great salespeople and marketing people who are open to opportunities, who figure out how the market is going, uh, you know, what customers really want uh, in their businesses. We also talk about the servant leader, someone who supports the process, someone who's in, in the back, who doesn't need the name up front. Now, we don't see servant leaders very often because most of our leaders are very extroverted, and the books about leaders or the stories about leaders are always about the individual who's out front, about the, the extrovert, about the people who's, the, the person who's doing the, uh, the leading. But we have people who are behind the scenes, who, who are less extroverted, who, who are really there to support the staff. And then we have systemic leaders, <coughs> leaders who really adjust to the context of the organization, who understand complexity. And this is what we need more and more in our world these days, as our systems become more complex, uh, things like healthcare reform, extremely complex. Uh, you know, the the, the, the uh, European euro, what's going on with the euro these days? International trade, extremely complex. Locally, intercollegiate athletics, extremely complex. Uh, how do we fund our school systems? How do we pay for housing? How do we do these things? All complex issues. And what we need are leaders uh, who deal with the system, who deal with the interactions of all the elements together. And again, that's, that's someone who, who really pushes ideas into this leadership working space. So just to know that there are different types of leaders, and I'm, I'm mentioning four here, there, there may be 20, there may be 50, I don't know. But, but I'm just recognizing that, that there are types of leaders. Uh, but what we don't usually recognize is, is that there are healthy, average, and unhealthy leaders. Uh, sometimes we think that if someone's at a leadership position, that they're automatically healthy leaders, that they automatically do a good job as a leader. But not really. And, and I, I'm picking uh, these three terms up from a, a book called Personality Types by Don Richard Rizzo. And I've changed the wording a little bit to, I guess, to help me understand it a little bit better. <clears throat> but Rizzo, in, in chapter eight of this book, which he calls The Leader, he, he talks about healthy leaders. And, and uh, healthy leaders champion people. Okay, that's what he defines as healthy. They're, they're protective and they're honorable. We've talked about honorable before, you know, in keeping in tune with the mission and being honest in our communications. But protective, as people kind of try to deal with complex issues and, and follow a, a leadership direction, things always don't work out smoothly. You need a leader who's gonna help you. Again, this is part of the facilitation. If things go wrong, you're gonna, you're gonna get a leader who's gonna stick with you. Uh, a champion of people has, has one trait that I think is absolutely necessary for leaders, and that's empathy. So a leader has to care about other people. And I, and I think that's, that's what Rizzo would, would talk about as a healthy leader. You know, empathetic, protective, they're, they're going to cover you if there's a mistake is made, and honorable. They're, they're going to be honest, straightforward on, on all dealings. Now that sounds pretty good. <clears throat> Are all leaders that way? What I like in this, this uh, taxonomy is we talk about average leaders, forceful, aggressive, expansive. <clears throat> you know, in, in looking at this uh, list of average leaders, I say, boy, this is what we usually teach in MBA courses. We teach people how to be aggressive in the marketplace. We teach them how to move forward. Uh, we, we, we teach them how to watch out for competition. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we teach leaders to be somewhat narciss narcissistic, that they have to stand up in front of people I'm, I'm in charge, I'm in charge, I'm in charge. You've got to make that, that statement. Controlling, I want to be forceful. I'm the leader, I'm the leader, I'm the leader. That's a, that's a good MBA course in leadership. We teach you that. But it's interesting to say, well, that's only average. What about unhealthy leaders? Again, maybe a, a touch of the MBA course in unhealthy leaders. Uh, relentless, ruthless, dictatorial. This, you know, this drive for success, drive for success. And a lot of people are driven by money, look, uh, driven by organizational position, and people you know, get in the way. And, and the idea of the goal of you know, making the organization a success 
you know, re reaching targets and all that sort of stuff, puts aside uh, the empathy, puts aside the protectiveness. You know, it's, it's sort of uh, sink or swim notion. And, and leaders to be influential and, and to facilitate change can't be throwing people under the bus. They, they, they can't be putting people aside. You have to keep going back to that healthy notion of, uh, of empathy. <clears throat> and I think this is, a, this is a key notion to remember for yourself and for others, <clears throat> that leaders have to stay healthy. If you're only average, get healthy. If you're unhealthy, at least be average. But work towards that idea of being a healthy leader. And, and, I, and I think that that's extremely important uh, for influence and facilitation. How does a leader stay healthy? You know, I, I think you stay healthy by attracting support from others rather than demanding independence. You know, the unhealthy leader, again, wants to be dictatorial. I'm in charge, I'm in charge, I'm in charge. Draw people into the discussion. Again, that leadership working space. Bring others into your working space. Get off that my way vector. You know, move into that space. Talk to people. Uh, be reassuring and calming, uh, and, and, and that enhances the capacity of leadership. You know, keep your emotions in check. So, so while you're talking to other people and, and asking them to have some sort of control over the situation, I think it's very important for you to keep control over your situation. Uh, you know, again, being calm, reassuring, uh, you know, not panicking, not falling into uh, angry rages. All that stuff drives people away and are, is non-empathetic. At the same time, you have to keep a steady pursuit of goals. So <clears throat> to stay healthy, you talk to people. In fact, if you look at you know, old types of therapy, uh, Freudian therapy was talking therapy. You talk to people. And, and so you, you stay healthy by talking to people. You, you stay healthy by, by reflecting on yourself and staying calm. But also, I think you stay healthy by, by working towards that 10-10 goal and, and not drifting off in, into someplace else or, or being, uh, having the goal of being distracted by anger, emotion, or whatever, that you're moving forward towards that 10-10. That <clears throat> and when all is said and done, what do you want as a healthy leader? You want two things. You want high-quality decisions, and you want acceptance of your decision. I mean, that's what we're looking at in leadership. You want to influence people towards a high-quality decision, and you want them to accept it. Bring in the facilitation end of it. You want action. You want to get it done. I'm not talking about types of decisions. I'm talking about the process of decision. So what makes for a high-quality decision? You have to understand that one solution is better than another. And I think as you're communicating with people, communicate differences. Uh, be critical in your thinking. Understand that, that there are differences in outcomes. If there weren't differences in outcomes, we wouldn't bother with leadership. It would just be just an easy shot. You just do one thing. But in reality, the majority of the complex situations in which leaderships find, leaders find themselves have to do with choices. So let people be clear about the choice. And that's part, again, of, of being in, in the, uh, the leadership working space. Uh, facilitate with information. I mentioned earlier that data doesn't sell, but information sells. Uh, I, I think back to Ronald Reagan and the State of the Union addresses in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, Reagan did, was provided information in a way that other presidents never had. He'd bring in stories. He'd, he'd tell about people. That's information, not necessarily data, not necessarily facts, but information. So, so you, you tell stories, you bring information into the mix. And the more people are informed, both with the, the uh, affective side and the, uh, the factual side, the better the decision will be. <clears throat> Getting to followers buy-in, of course, that's a big question. How do you get people to, to provide buy-in? Go back to the, uh, the four points that I made about uh, Chester, from Chester Barnard. They'll buy in if they understand things, if, if the communication is clear. They'll buy in if it's, if it's got uh, association with mission. They'll buy in if uh, it's in their self-interest. And they'll buy in if they can do it. So, so that, that's part of you know, looking for this acceptance of a high-quality decision. 
we mentioned communication before. Uh, you know, you have to communicate. You have to communicate honestly. Uh, and, and another thing for, for buy-in, a leader must be aware of potential conflicts. And again, this is, this is what you do in that leadership working space. You talk to people over the potential of conflicts. You try to work through them. You try to you know, kind of go back to those things. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Do we know what the end is? Is this the right thing to do? Is this fit with our mission? How do you feel about it? Do you like this idea? Uh, do you accept it of value? Is this something of value for you? And are we able to accomplish this? I think if, if, you, if you keep looking at those four points and keep understanding that leadership has to do with this leadership working space, I, I think you have something. I, I think it, it's, it's simple and hard at the same time. It's a simple concept, but hard to implement. Go back to our two film clips. Take another look at them. Take a look at how these two characters influence people, how they pull them off their working space. In the Gregory Peck scene, the, the words are harsh. You know, this is, this is not a happy uh, pronouncement that he's making. What does that do to people? It shakes them up. He's shaking up complexity. What does Kenneth Brown and Henry V do? His, his words are soft. How is he shaping that? He's talking about joining. He's, he's, he's using emotion to draw people in. Either way, there are efforts to influence people to move them off their vectors into this leadership working space. And once you get them thinking about things, once you get them working, goals could be attained. People will buy in. You know, good ends will be met. And I think that's the role of the leader.